Aloha! You are listening to Inside the Desert Oasis Room, episode number 217. This episode is sponsored by the Tiki Bar T-Shirt Club, where their monthly t-shirt designs pay tribute to a Polynesian bar or restaurant from days long past. Each design is available for a limited time and will never be produced again. For the collectors out there, be sure to check out their subscription program, where they offer a discounted 3, 6, or 12-month plan, or you can always buy shirts one at a time. For more information and to check out this month's shirt, visit TikiBarTshirtClub.com. This podcast is sponsored by Frogtown Brewery, an independent craft brewery and tap room located in Northeast Los Angeles. Stop in and enjoy one of their excellent beers from their ever-changing, diverse menu. Tell them that Inside the Desert Oasis Room sent you and get your first pint on us. Limitations apply. For more information, go to frogtownbrewery.com and follow them on social media at Frogtown Brewery. Today, we join our friends Brandon and Kim Grill, owners of the Kazan Room, Kobe Japan's first and only tiki bar. Hear what brought them from Portland, Oregon to Kobe, Japan, and what it took to open their bar, what the cocktail scene is like, the differences in culture, palates, and ingredients, and where you can see and possibly sample more from the Kazan Room, right here in the United States. As always, I hope you enjoyed this episode as much as we did bringing it to you. If you'd like to follow our adventures, check out our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash Polynesian Pop where we chronicle events, bars, travel spots, cocktail tutorials, and more. And if you enjoy this podcast, please consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash Polynesian Pop, where membership grants you early access to podcasts and videos, front-of-the-line privileges to new merch releases, as well as exclusive content, meetups, and screen credits. All righty, let's get into this. Pour yourself a cocktail and join us inside the Desert Oasis Room. And give it up for my friends Brandon and Kim Grill. Aloha. Aloha. How are you guys doing? Uh, good. good. How are you? Awesome. Thanks. What time is it over there for you guys? Uh, it's noon right now. Noon. Okay. So you guys are just pretty much starting your day? And uh, I mean, we have a two-year-old, so no, we've been oh, outside so no, you've for been up. a few hours now, but... Yeah, we've got a long day ahead of us. Yeah. Okay, well, mm-hmm. I apologize for the broad assumption. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> my kids are all grown up now. My son is 23, my daughter's 20, and um, wow. I all I will say is that I really miss them at that age, but I do remember when my son was somewhere around that age, I do remember thinking, I don't know if I'm ever going to have a full night of sleep ever again like when is this when am i going to get that you know um but the time goes by so fast yeah Mm -hmm. we do we do i know you much older but still the two years have flown by and yeah 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 wow crazy stuff cool now though so don't worry about that we're here in the uh in the bar he's in school today so we're just uh having a drink at noon oh i love it um (laughs) <laughs> well, you can do that. To hang out. You can do that when you own a bar, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Awesome. Well, for our yeah. listeners out there, uh, let's welcome our friends, Brandon and Kim. Is it Grilk? Am I pronouncing that correctly? Uh, Grilk. Grilk. Yeah. Okay. From the Kazan Room in Japan. Welcome to the podcast. Thank Thanks. you. Thanks for having us. I appreciate you guys coming on. I owe you an apology because I know we've been talking about doing this podcast for quite a while and I have no excuse. It kind of fell off my radar. So I'm glad that we were able to finally get this set up. So I apologize. Oh, accepted. No problem. Don't worry about it. (laughs) Well, I appreciate that. Thanks for having us on. I appreciate that. Well, welcome to the show. For our listeners that don't know 
your guys' backgrounds. Can I just ask you guys to give us a quick, like, high-level level overview of your backgrounds, where you're from and where you are today and, like, what brought you to Japan and all that kind of stuff? Of course. Yeah. Um, so my name's Kim, and I am originally from San Diego, California, and um, we were living in Portland for a while before moving out here to Japan, and uh, I was working as a teacher there. Um, teaching English. And that's kind of what brought us to Japan, too, is um, uh, we came out here to teach English and just have kind of an adventure, travel. Um, you know, we've gotten to see a lot of Asia from traveling from here before mm -hmm. coronavirus, sure. of course. Yeah. But um, yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. Brandon. Um, yeah. My name's Brandon. I grew up in Illinois, moved out to San Diego for college around 2004 and then we ended up going a, to Oregon. I went to grad school at Eugene, uh, at the University of Oregon, and then we slowly worked our way up the, the West Coast and then ended up in Portland. And that was around 2014 or so, something like that. And I was working as a historian there for the time we were living in Portland. And yeah, that's where we fell in love with Tiki too, with wow. a lot of the great Tiki bars in the Portland area. Mm -hmm. And um, that's how it all started. Um, and then like my wife said, yeah, we moved out here for teaching. She wanted to teach abroad. I said, I could probably do that. And, and then, yeah, just that's what got us here. And then, yeah, our love for Tiki and really the lack of Tiki availability is Options. what kind of led us to opening the bar too. Right. Like, right. You know, classic classic immigrant story of moving to a foreign land and not having your culture available. So yeah. anyway, we can get into that later. Maybe I'm not sure. But yeah, yeah I, we'll we'll talk about all, right. all of that. I I have so many questions now because Kim, you're a teacher, and Brandon, you're a historian. Mm -hmm. Did you ever envision yourself owning a tiki bar in Japan? That just sounds so <laughs> like. <laughs> different from that career uh, path that you started. Yeah. Yeah, no, we we didn't. Um, I mean, we actually didn't even really have much of an interest in Japan before coming here. Um, it was kind of just like we we wanted to teach English, or I did, and we picked a, a place that, um, you know, needed English teachers and had pretty decent benefits yeah. of living here. So, yeah. Wow. Um, before that, you know, we weren't really interested yeah, in the right. culture or Other anime. than just your superficial, you know, Nintendo sushi. <laughs> right. You know, we were, <laughs> yeah, we were not Japanophiles and I'm sorry to disappoint any <laughs> listeners. Who, who thought we were geeking out on Japan. It's just, that's where we ended up. Um, mm -hmm. So. Yeah. Wow. So, Okay. You're gonna have to bear with me here because now I have all these questions that I want to ask sure. you. So, like, number one, how do you even find a teaching job in Japan? And did you consider any other countries for that? Like, why specifically Japan? Um, yeah. We did uh, consider other countries. Um, you know, we thought Europe would be a fun place to live for a while, too. Mm -hmm. um, but it's, I think Asian countries especially um, are big on teaching English mm -hmm. right, um, right. and are, you know, looking for teachers and giving pretty good benefits for it. Um, so, yeah, it was really just the, the program that we got involved with mm -hmm. um, to bring us over to Japan. We, you know, were able to secure jobs before leaving the U.S. Um, so and they kind of helped us with with the move and um, kind okay. of ushering us into this country and oh, into the culture and that um, getting us. Set up, get our feet wet. Yeah, yeah. That I mean, they so. paid for our airfare. They didn't help yeah. us with anything well, else. Oh, okay, <laughs> okay. We were out here stranded with a couple <laughs> pieces of luggage looking for apartments, you know. <laughs> no. But wow. we made it work. Now, have you guys lived abroad before? Is this your first time living abroad? Uh, first time. Yes. Yeah. So, what was that transition yeah. like? And and also, like, that's a huge thing. So. A, you know, my I wasn't even born here in the United States. I was born in the Philippines because my parents mm. were immigrants from the Philippines. And, you know, I took that for granted. And then one day a friend of mine said to me, and this is when I was in college, he said to me, um, do you know what our parents went through in search of a better life 
that they picked up everything and left their not not only their country but their family, their friends, their jobs, and they didn't know where they were you know, what they were getting into. Like it was just for the hope of something better and you know, most of mm-hmm. them didn't and like my parents didn't have anything lined up when they came here. And uh, and and it never really hit me until my friend said that, and he said he said something like, "Imagine you doing that," and I thought, "Yeah, holy moly, that's a big move." So, talk to me about like what that transition was like. Did you have any second thoughts? And and then also like, what did that take? Like selling all your stuff and bank accounts and you know all that. Like, what was that like? Yeah. So. Well, you know, unlike your family, it sounds like we weren't as attached. You know, we were we were married, but we didn't have kids. We didn't have a home. So we weren't really leaving that behind. Uh, we did leave our careers behind. But at the same time, we're both professionals. We can always pick those back up if in if we choose to when if we return. To. Right. And as far as the bank accounts and things like that, we still maintain, you know, a P.O. box and some American accounts and but yeah, we sold everything. Uh, we, we have a, a storage we have a, unit. A yeah, storage unit with our tiki motion. Yeah, we're still <laughs> regretting that. Um, but we were able to send the Boscos out from our storage unit, okay. so we were really happy about that. A um, little less fragile than you know right. a couple They're, boxes full of tiki mugs. Right. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, you know, I think we just wanted something different. We were we were having a lot of fun in Portland and we were transitioning, you know, our jobs were probably asking a little bit more of us and we were just, I don't know if we were ready to really settle down. And so we thought we'd try and come out here and teach and just, yeah, and do some tab uh, traveling, stuff like that. As far as the like culture shock goes, um, you know, we were told before coming here that it'll come in waves up mm-hmm. and down. And I think that's definitely true. You know, there've been moments when I felt unhappy here or I felt not accepted by the culture yeah, and then there yeah. are times when I felt very accepted and appreciated especially yeah. by people in our close-knit community yeah. in this neighborhood um so yeah it's definitely been a bit of a roller coaster of, of feelings um for sure and yeah. just to comment on that you know we have been teaching for a few years and Kim still teaches now and I maintain and run the bar and you know, over the years that we were teaching, we were never really validated, right? So during graduations and other things, we were always still, I would say, treated as the novelty, you know, uh, foreign uh, English teacher. Mm -hmm. But when we opened the bar, when we opened the bar, some of the bars that we used to go to and we hadn't even been to for years due to the pandemic and having a kid literally sent bouquets of flowers for oh, that's our opening, nice. which is a Japanese tradition. That's nice. And it was yeah. nice, but you know, it was just, it was just so validating that, you know, for the longest time in a certain career, we weren't getting that. And then yeah. when we followed our passion to open the bar, the, the community the bar community reciprocated and really opened uh, their arms to us and mm. celebrated that. And so again, as Kim was saying, there's the ebbs and flows. There's times where, we're feeling maybe, you know, a little prejudice or we're not getting through because of this or that, or we just have a language barrier. Right. But then on the other time, other times, yeah, it was just really, really sweet and couldn't have been happier, you know, especially when we're taking such a big plunge to, you know, start our own business in a foreign country and do tiki in a foreign country that doesn't really have a tiki, you know, uh, baseline. Right. And so it was just, um, yeah, just, it was interesting. It's, yeah, we're still here because, yeah, we're having fun and we love living here. But it's just that's just a good example of what yeah. I think Kim was referring to. Now, how long how long ago did you guys transition over to Japan? How, how many years? Uh, about five years now. Oh, OK. So you've been there for, for a few years now. So, wow. So five yeah. years ago, that was, what, 2018? So, yeah. so you were there when everything was normal and then you went into ben- pandemic. Mm-hmm. Which yeah. right. that sounds like an interesting topic in and of itself because are you familiar with how it was treated here in America, the pandemic? Yeah, yeah. I think we followed the news. A lot. Yeah, and so, you know our families are American. We couldn't sure. avoid it. Let's just say that, right? Yeah. So, yeah, I mean it was it was 
definitely surreal. I, I just thought, like, I, in the beginning, I was so resistant. I thought, how are we going to do this? I mean, people have to live their lives, right? But um, yeah. yeah, somehow we we went through it, and I actually found a little bit of peace from it because I didn't feel pressure to go do stuff, and I got comfortable being at home. I always was yeah. one of these guys that was like, you know, the whole FOMO thing, you know, like, oh, man, I don't want to yeah. miss this. I don't want to miss that. But then I learned to like just Netflix and chill, you know. And, <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> right. And I wasn't spending money. Yeah. And I was I was making my I, own drinks and just kind of enjoying my personal time. You know, what was it like in Japan? Was it? Was everything like really strictly shut down? Um, you know, I don't, I wouldn't say it was strict because they can't, I think the government wasn't able to actually enforce restrictions, yeah. mm -hmm. but they requested that businesses close or close early. And in Japan, everyone pretty much just conforms and, and does right. what they're asked to do. Sure. Um, so yeah, businesses would close for a while and there were different waves, you know, when, when things spiked, they would ask businesses to close early mm -hmm. or they limited alcohol. Like there was no alcohol sales for a while. However, I heard that there were speakeasies going on. Oh yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh but yeah. Maybe that's a different topic. So. <laughs> oh no, but. we can talk about that. I'm curious because, so let me ask you just, just straight up. Did you guys go to any speakeasies? <laughs> Well, well, it was yeah, pandemic. No. Were you I mean, we've that? been out when they weren't allowed, like a, the government suggested that you shouldn't sell alcohol. And we were out during that time, especially during the Olympics. We were mm -hmm. up in Tokyo. Kim was volunteering at the Olympics. Um, what was it last year or two years ago? And yeah. so we were out in Tokyo and they weren't quote unquote supposed to sell alcohol, but we were able to get alcohol. So <laughs> okay. let's just say that wasn't a speakeasy <laughs> right. necessarily, but Maybe just asking the right questions. I had it on, um, on hand. So. so right. Well, you know, it's funny that you mentioned the speakeasy thing because it's something that I completely had forgotten. So here in the L.A. area, I knew of two, I mean, commercial bars that are very popular in the tiki community that I actually frequented as speakeasies during the pandemic. Mm -hmm. uh, nice. And one, and then there was a, a third. A bar. It was a home bar from a bartender that worked in another bar. We can talk about all of this mm. with the recorders off. <laughs> but yeah. um, he was running a speakeasy out of his apartment, and he was basically you texted him or called him for a reservation, and he would he would put menus out and and serve <laughs> his original cocktails from his kitchen. And uh, nice. yeah, yeah. He, 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 going there. he actually did pretty good. He bought a motorcycle after all of it. <laughs> so, <laughs> I mean, it was a true speakeasy. Yeah, we were we were kind of breaking the rules, you know. So, um, mm. but it was fun, you cool. know. I mean, like it, it was different. I I can't see us going through that again. I I think we'll have a lot more mm -hmm. resistance this time around if if they if they tried to like repeat like shutting everything down because it hurt a lot of businesses. You know, a lot of people mm -hmm. didn't survive and a lot of big chains didn't survive, which I, I was actually like kind of surprised by some of the chains that shut down, you know, like soup plantation we lost, which was one of my favorites, mm -hmm. you know? Um, yeah. so that's kind of a bummer, but so five years, yeah. five years is a long mm -hmm. time now. It, are you guys, okay. I have a couple of stupid questions. Okay. So number one, yeah. let me ask you this. What do you miss most about the U.S.? And number two, do you guys still celebrate American holidays over there yourself, like Thanksgiving and Easter and July 4th? Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, sure. yeah, to start with number two, most definitely. <laughs> I mean, we're still American. We just live in Japan. So, yeah, we still participate in the traditional, at least American holidays that are celebrated there and uh, we picked up a few Japanese holidays too, or we've tried to do our best to influence, you know, uh, raise our son with some of these more traditional mm -hmm. Japanese holidays. Okay. But we definitely we keep all a, the. Basics. We get a Christmas tree every year at IKEA. Yeah, exactly. Okay. We do have a live, like a, a real Christmas tree for the holidays. Um, now, they, our, the only place that sells Christmas trees is yeah. IKEA. Maybe yeah, you have to buy oh, it at really? IKEA, maybe Costco, <laughs> but. 
Are you guys yeah. doing KFC at Christmas? We yeah, do, we yeah. do. Yeah. Okay. yeah, we picked up that. <laughs> but I order it on Thanksgiving because if you try and go on Christmas Day or anywhere near it, it's sold out or you're waiting in line. And it's typically maybe one degrees that time of year. So wow. Any, anyone who wants to have KFC in Japan, order it a month early, okay? You have to. Like, you're going to regret it. So explain that to the Americans that are listening, because I don't think most people from the United States know that tradition. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so it was uh, started by a KFC franchise in Nagoya, where he just decided that he was going to sell a special bucket on Christmas. Oh, well, uh, uh, an expat asked for it one time because it's like kind of the closest thing that you can get to turkey. To turkey mm. is, you know, they don't re- they don't sell turkey here. Yeah, and no one has an oven big enough to cook it anyway. True, right? So, um, yeah, an expat went into KFC and asked for a bucket of chicken for Christmas, and so this uh, this shop owner or manager decided that he was going to tell or advertise to everyone that. Everyone in America eats KFC mm, on Christmas. Yes. <laughs> so so no. he started running this campaign telling Japanese people this is the traditional like Christmas right. thing in America. So mm-hmm. this is before um, the internet too, so you can imagine. <laughs> it was like, back in like the seventies. Yeah. Right? Oh, so. it was that long ago. Because I know people go crazy yeah. for KFC at, at Christmas. So mm-hmm. so if they're not doing turkeys, then if you guys are celebrating Thanksgiving there while you're there. Are you doing KFC? Yeah. Thanksgiving, we picked up some turkey legs. Yeah, this um, year we okay. did. We okay. actually, this year, we got ourselves an oven. Like a like table, a countertop like a oven. countertop oven, yeah. And we got, we found some turkey legs online on like Amazon. Yeah. <laughs> and <laughs> they were pretty good. Yeah, they were good. <laughs> but prior to that, we were just doing. I love that you ordered maybe turkey legs on Amazon. Or something like that. Uh-huh. I don't know. Just trying to keep it American, but. Yeah, you know, I love it. I love it. Yeah, that would be something that would be kind of a tough one to give up. Although I was born in the Philippines, I came here when I was three years old, and I grew up in Southern California. So a lot of my traditions are not just from my homeland, but they are American, right? Because this is where I grew up. Mm-hmm. So if I went abroad, it would be hard for me to give that up. I I had a boss back in the day that he's lived all over the world because you know he was a CIO type of position and Mm -hmm. so at one point he was in when he was in Spain he was living in Spain but he was uh, still kind of connected to our department in a weird kind of way and over there he would buy um, he'd buy like Thanksgiving dinner kind of stuff and he would serve it to his team in Spain during Thanksgiving and he would educate them on what Thanksgiving was in the United States even though he wasn't really from here but he spent some time here, so he learned that custom, and he did that all over the world. So wherever he was, he'd say, "Oh, so this is what they celebrate in, you know, wherever at at this time of year. So this is what we're gonna do." And he did something like that for us, where there was some holiday where he brought in food, and it was weird, but you know, it was also cool at the same time. It's just we weren't used to it, you know. So what is it that you miss most uh, about being in Japan now? What do you miss most from the U.S.? I had an in and out for lunch today. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, that's the first thing. That's, that's the our first, first stop. Yeah. Sorry, when I didn't we mean to, from the airport. I didn't mean to brag. <laughs> yeah, just food, food in general. Um, we do most of our cooking at home, though, so we still kind of um, partake in, uh, well, all kinds of food. I mean, you know, yeah. America. I, I don't know if America has its own food. It's you know a mix of many right, different yeah. cultures. So we cook all that, you know, Mexican food and Chinese food and Thai food and yeah, and you know the American so. palate is very and diverse. Pizza and hamburgers yeah, and, right. But we do all that at home. So. It's hard to find like real authentic, like American food or food that we're used to in America here. Because even when they are doing it. They might be using the wrong spice or they're not using refried beans or they're substituting sure. things that might just cost more expensive with things that are available. And it's just like, I know you're trying to make, you know, a burrito here, but you're using right. like chickpeas and it's not the same. You right. know what I mean? Like you like, may have fooled the Japanese people, but you're not fooling me, right? Well, like a can of 
chili. Yeah, yeah. or yeah. chili. Yeah, yeah, like some Hormel chips, chili like, or something. And it's well, that's they're not that they're not gonna know it any better, you know. So they they can get know. away with it. But I mean, if Kim is from San Diego, I mean, mm-hmm. in my opinion, San Diego area has the best Mexican food in the world. So. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, like if you grow up having that Mexican food, I mean, you're, you're, you're ruined, you know, you can't go anywhere. <laughs> you can't go anywhere. Yeah, that's... Right. I mean, like I would argue yeah. even in some places in Mexico, the food in Mexican food in San Diego is better because the, the ingredients are better, you know? So sure. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. Of that. yeah so yeah, I agree with Mexican food for sure. And then also they're probably adjusting, food to the local palate right so because i went to the coca-cola yeah. museum for example in atlanta and you could taste coke that's served all over the world and it's adjusted for the local palate to where it's shipped to right so mm-hmm. the coke in japan is going to taste different from the coke in america just like the people in america prefer to drink mexican coke over the coke that's mm-hmm. yeah, in america right because yeah. Yeah, the Japanese palate uh, doesn't really care for spice very much. Uh, mm. Most of their food's fairly bland. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yes, it's Maybe savory if anything. Yeah. Yeah. Salty with the sochu and okay or shoyu. Yeah, okay. yeah but which uh, yeah has been interesting for us opening a tiki bar and introducing pimento drams yeah. and falernums and overproof rums and. Uh, we don't use spiced rums, but you know, dark right. rums and light rums with Jamaican, you know what I mean? Rums have oh, so totally. many different flavor profiles that, uh, yeah, are really unique and new to at least our Japanese yeah, yeah. audience. Uh, a lot of foreign yeah. audience, but people from the UK or people from America who've grown up with cinnamon and cloves as part of their everyday diet, diet are in love, but, for Japanese people, you know, Blue Hawaii seems to be more on the line <laughs> with their palate. Okay. Um, citrusy, a little sugary. Yeah. So as soon as you start saying all of these ingredients, allspice and falernum and all this kind of stuff, bitters, mm-hmm. that's got to be so alien to the local Japanese palate. How do people, mm-hmm. how do they respond to that when they come to the when they they come to your bar, have your cocktails for the first time, are they shocked? Like, what's their reaction? I mean, usually they're like just in awe. Yeah, <laughs> they seem to like it. I mean, mm. they you know they say they're very delicious oishi in Japanese. Yeah, um, they are. I'm just curious what they think when they go home yeah. or how their body yeah. reacts to it too. You know, there's no. You know, because also our drinks are made, our specs are kind of made based on the historic, right? you know, recipes. You know. So the volume is much higher. Now they're well balanced, so it's harder to, you know, really know what you're drinking or how much volume you're drinking. Yeah, alcohol content. Yeah, the alcohol content, yeah. excuse me. Yeah. And so most of the Japanese cocktails here we get, or we used to get anyway, would probably be around maybe one, one and a half ounces of spirit or a mixture of spirits. And so when we're doing a zombie punch Holy or a moly. jet pilot or a Navy grog. Holy moly. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, and we have some people come in who think they're, you know, <laughs> they think they can handle it, especially the Japanese businessmen. Like, give me a four, you know, right. give me a number four. Right. And, and friends talking about Yeah. Like, and, uh, it. yeah, it's usually a one hit punch. One there. Hit. Yeah. Or whatever, you know, they are usually... They're like asking for water yeah. pretty quickly. Like, okay. Yeah. So let me yeah. ask you this then. So with, with that in mind, so talk about your process with how you come up with your original cocktails then, because mm-hmm. are you, are you adjusting them to that local palate and their tolerance? And also, mm-hmm. I mean, like what are the limitations of the ingredients that you can get there? Or is it, similar to here can you get most of the same stuff for the cocktails um you can get most ingredients well i mean most most rums or liquors you can get um we make some substitutions for brands or you know there's certain things we can't get here like the smith and cross or Mm -hmm. like you know some of the overproof rums um but 
Uh, the originals we have on the menu, uh, I created two of them and I wanted to just take some inspiration from Japanese culture, Japanese ingredients. Um, so not ne- I wasn't necessarily thinking of their palate. I was just thinking of, you know, what do we have here in Japan that is unique from, you know, what's available in the U S. Mm-hmm. And so I came up with, a one using a sakura liqueur. So that's like a cherry blossom uh, liqueur. Uh, I call it the good. sakura sling. So it's um, a bit of a take on the Singapore sling. Mm-hmm. Um, and it is also lower in alcohol content, but I wasn't necessarily, I mean, it's in a coupe, but okay. so it's just a smaller cocktail. Um, and then the other one I created was the Kokobe. So named after our, city here of Kobe, Mm -hmm. um, which uses coconut along with uh, Japanese whiskey, the Mm -hmm. Suntory whiskey. Um, And so it's a bit like a pina colada with coconut. um, I use some lime in there, uh, pineapple and the whiskey. And I think it that sounds delicious. Just um, works really well together. That sounds delicious. Yeah. um, Yeah. And to build on that, you know, like Don Beach, it's just more affordable to use local spirits. Sure. And so it's really to our advantage to be experimenting with, you know, sake and, uh, show, uh, so, so or chew, uh, yeah. And whiskeys and Japanese whiskeys, uh, with the tiki like flavor palette. Um, because again, it's, it's just affordable. It's, it's available. It's never going to leave the, the, the stores in which we buy them where mm-hmm. sometimes a plantation, we use plantation a lot. Um, sometimes they might not have it for a week or two, right? Because the distributor is backed up or whatever. Okay. And so, you know, for us just kind of being, you know, business savvy, we wanted to play with some local spirits, uh, for security, but, you know, try and blend the Japanese tiki fusion that we we kind of got going on naturally, right? I mean, yeah. So, what what is the local cocktail scene like out there? Is it is it is it very centric to what they the to the spirits of Japan, or it, like if if I were to go to say an upscale bar there in your area? Would I find a lot of the same cocktails that we get here in the States? Um, you know, a lot of upscale bars actually don't have menus. So they, they typically just say, what's your flavor profile? What do you like? And then they riff on that. Um, we've noticed that quite a bit. And or they just have shelves and shelves of Japanese whiskey. Which yeah, that can too. Drink meat Straight. on the rocks or mm-hmm. with soda. <laughs> Is that what mostly people are drinking? whiskey yeah, yeah for yeah. sure okay yeah. yeah at the nice yeah nice white glove kind yeah. of cocktail bar it's usually a whiskey bar. i mean at the, yeah the road is definitely going to be high-end whiskeys probably drinking neat on the rocks uh, maybe even cigars but oh. you know the bartender is going to have three-piece suit three-piece shaker oh oh nice it's going to be very you know just mm, sophisticated you know yeah. high level yeah that's um, what it sounds like not as uh, uh not as uh mm-hmm. i don't want to say novel as tiki because i don't want to trivialize tiki, but ingredients. yeah um i get what you're saying then, though. you know the room would be probably just beer highballs right fountain highballs too or they you know the they just have them yeah already already to go fountain highballs fountain Right. Uh, true highs and beer. Um, so the in between would be, yeah, just off menu ingredients. But for us, again, kind of going back to what we were talking about earlier, just people don't carry falernum. They don't yeah. carry orja. They don't have pimento dram or allspice dram. And so when I go in, I ask for a zombie, they might not even have passion fruit, you know? So not to say zombie 1934 has passion fruit, but the 1950 does, but you know what I mean? So it's just, they don't carry those ingredients. And so when we go out with our flavor palette, it's hard to really match what we're looking for. Yeah. So those are ingredients that we've had to create and make ourselves here at the bar. So those are things we can't find. And 
um, have, yeah, have just started making ourselves. That's, that's ironic because so, you know, it, it's always better to make your own syrups and make your own falernum and make your mm -hmm. own uh, mm -hmm. allspice dram and all that kind of stuff. Right. And so the irony mm -hmm. is that it it's, you're making it because you can't find it, but it's making your drinks better, right? Because yeah, everything yeah. is, everything is, um, is scratch made. So you guys, it sounds like mm -hmm. are really doing something different than what the local bar patron is seeing then with the tropical mm -hmm. bar and the tropical cocktails. Yes. Most different. definitely. Yeah. Are there any other I'm themed or experiential type bars or restaurants there um, like, you know, like a themed, I don't know, for lack of a better term, like a themed Mexican restaurant or a themed German restaurant, you know, kind of the way that yeah, we yeah. have these themed Polynesian restaurants. Uh, yeah, they, um, so there's like kind of English pubs mm -hmm. and then there's, oh, okay. um, Mexican restaurants. Yeah, but, but very, just run to by preface Japanese this people. though, yeah, very few of these bars or restaurants are run by the people there. Mm -hmm sampling right so yeah. it's a japanese person who may have visited mexico once or got gotcha. a japanese person who is infatuated with germany and they open up a german style restaurant or beer house or something where it's like you don't really have foreigners doing this on a mass scale right and doing it authentically so mm -hmm. but yeah when they do it in terms of what you're asking do we see that kind of themed restaurant or bar um, sure, but typically English pub, Irish pub, German beer house, or yeah, Mexican restaurant with uh, you know all kinds of different Mexican novelty type stuff in there. But is there's it? Some, there's some pretty cool um, American style diners that okay. are also run by Japanese people, but you know they are really into american like kind of 50s culture mm, right. kind of rockabilly culture yeah, right. and so they'll they'll do some decent you know americana style food and bar yeah but when they yeah, do these sure. when they do this like experiential stuff or this the steam stuff is it are they trying to be authentic or are they really just trying to be more uh you know like over the top or more character based I think it's exactly what Tiki is to the imagery of Polynesia before air travel. Gotcha. Is what Japanese people are trying to do with whatever country right, they're trying right. to sample. Okay. And so sometimes it doesn't relate necessarily directly. Sometimes they might be using, you know, different cultural artifacts and mm. it's a little off for the American yeah. or the Mexican or whomever goes in there. And it's like, okay, that's Peruvian and that's, you know, this and that. Gotcha. And you're kind of sampling all of South America or, you know. But maybe they're trying. Yeah, but that's that's how it is. That's probably easily more easily said. Okay. That sounds interesting. Now it makes me want to see that. It's like seeing – so my <laughs> wife went to Barcelona, I think it was last year or the year before. She, like, had a girl's trip to Barcelona and it sounds like the style of tiki they're trying to do in Barcelona, right? In Spain. It's like what they mm. think tiki is. It's not disrespectful or anything. Um, but they're trying to bring this kind of sense of what they believe the tropics is, right? And they're trying yeah, to do the tropical yeah. drink thing. And they're trying to do their, their own style of tiki mugs and all of that kind of stuff. It's obviously not accurate, but the intention is mm -hmm. there. So that's what it sounds like to me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Okay. So talk to me about how you ended up opening the Kazan room, because here in the United States, there's so much bureaucracy behind opening a bar, right? With a business license and a food license and a liquor license. And then, you know, finding a space and working with an architect or a designer, hiring a, you know, bar staff, hiring kitchen staff, designing products that you're going to serve, designing merch. I mean, there's so much behind that. How much of that did you have to go through for? And and by the way, am I saying it correctly? Is it Kazan Room? Uh, I would say Kazan Room. Yeah, Kazan. Uh, Kazan, Kazan Room. Kazan. Okay. Yeah. okay, I apologize for that. So uh, for Kazan Room. Okay. So how much of that is similar and how much of that is different? Like, 
were you fish out of water when you were trying to get everything lined up to open this business? Uh, yeah. I mean, it's our first business. I mean, we don't really speak the language very well. And I use some friends that have businesses that do speak English, Japanese people, and they helped me a little bit. But by and large, it was just going down to the city office, going to the permit office, uh, bringing the proper documents from what I could find online and translate and, you know, setting up an inspection to get our business permit. As far as the food handling, you know, permit, that was an online course. Okay. We don't have liquor licenses here. So anyone can serve alcohol without going through a distributor or paying wow. whatever that is. I don't really know what it's like in America. So oh. I know it's competitive and it's limited to wow. regions and states and all that, but we don't have that. So that's also why there's bars here that are a dime a dozen. There's probably 50 bars in a three block radius. Cause anyone and any, everyone can open a bar here. Mm. Um, and it, it's very saturated, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, which, you know, has its, yeah. And so that was the logistics of setting up the business was just kind of going through the bureaucracy, but it wasn't, and I wouldn't say it was so much of an issue. We used a broker to find this place. And once we had the blueprints done, which I did myself, took that to the city office and they came in, did the inspection, made sure we had all the proper equipment and refrigeration and all that. And then the food handling license I did online. And so we're, yeah, it was, we're all bona fide and it wasn't so dif difficult. I actually think okay. it's quite easy compared to what I hear is going on and how it goes down in America. Yeah. Yeah. yeah a lot of bureaucracy oh. in America for that, especially like, California seems to have more bureaucracy than a lot of the other states, and you'd be shocked to hear what some of the what what people are paying for a liquor license. So yeah. in LA, you probably yeah, heard yeah, these numbers. You know, half yeah, a million. Yeah, we're a teacher plus, and historian, you know. so you know we're not. This isn't a million dollar bar, you <laughs> right? Know, nowhere near it. So yeah, yeah. I just you know, not even close, and we're not part mm -hmm. of some large you know restaurant group that can even afford that. So it's definitely. Uh, yeah, it's just yeah, and I, I think that's why we decided to do it here um, mm -hmm. because it felt very accessible. Like we could, you know, we could do it and we can uh, get our feet wet here and um, just see what it takes to run a bar and right. um, you know maybe in the future take that experience back to America mm -hmm. with us and um, potentially okay. do something there. Yeah, but, I mean because it's operational, the skills that we're learning and applying are universal. Um, it's just, we didn't have to put the, the upfront cost as an entrepreneur would in America or have the in backing investors or however you would even raise that capital we were able to do with, um, with yeah our own. So that's awesome. Yeah. That's, that's mm -hmm. really awesome. Well, you know, one of these days I hope to find myself over there. I'd love to visit, not just Japan, but it's on my bucket list. But see you guys try your your cocktails, especially your local cocktails that at what you're making with the local ingredients. That would be something that I need to put on on my to do list. So I, I'm going to try to make that happen one day. Um, okay, uh, so that our local cocktail, the Sakura Sling. Um, I just found out two days ago that um, it's going to be or I will be showcasing it at the, what's it called? Uh, the Tokyo International Bar Show. Bar Show, yeah. Oh, so there's cool. a, a women's bartender competition there that I'm competing in. So Oh, I love it. Um, they, yeah, they accepted my cocktail, yeah. and I'm excited to... Put Tiki on the map. You know, yeah. we're really trying to, again, break through just not by being American and kind of being this novelty cocktail bar, but to showcase that these drinks are really good. And you may have actually had ours. If you were at Tiki Oasis oh, yeah. last year, we did I was. present our Sakura Sling at the, what is it? Cocktail with Tiki Oasis, the, uh, the Tiki Oasis mug, mug pickup yeah. party yeah. where they had all the different bartending okay. booths. So, so yeah, okay. you may have, had I, I may don't know have. If, you, if you had that, but I may have. So here's the thing, Brandon. Yeah. I, yeah. So I, you know how Tiki Oasis is like the Super Bowl of drinking. 
So I, I, I'm sure it was one of the hundreds of drinks that were put in front of me <laughs> for the weekend. Yeah. So, yeah. so yeah, I, I just happened. don't remember, but I probably did <laughs> sample it. So, yeah. But now, like, as, but we'd love as a, that, you know. I would love to be there, but as a conscious uh, imbiber and conscious patron and not, you know, somebody that's like, you know, half half awake, half sober. You know, when you're walking around TK Oasis, it's like you're walking around Vegas, right? You lack of sleep, you're hungover, you're you're tired as hell, mm -hmm. and um, and you're just you're 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 trying to have fun, and you've got three days, right? So mm -hmm. it's a it's a marathon, right? So um, yeah. So when I'm more when I'm more um, uh, what's the right word? When I'm more present, uh, I would really love to try. Mm -hmm your cocktails. So um, I want to move on because I'm trying to manage our time. Uh, sure. So I want to get to some of my party questions here, which I like to ask all of my guests that are on the podcast. Now, I did listen to an episode of you guys on another podcast, which I thoroughly enjoyed. And oh, they, thank you. they asked one of my questions, <laughs> which, which was like, which was the superpower question. The superpower question I always ask if you could pick any superpower. And Kim actually gave the answer that I always give, which is teleportation. Mm. Because if I could teleport, then I could go I could go to Hawaii for breakfast and then the Mai Kai for, yeah. for dinner. I could see you guys for happy hour. Yeah, I could right. I could go wherever mm -hmm. I want, right? right? You, you could can you could live life to the now. Fullest, <laughs> like, right? I'm working on that because yeah. we need that now. We need more tiki tourists here. Like I, I would, want them to be here yeah, for happy gotta, hour. We got to find a way to make the teleportation thing happen. But uh, what I'm going to do <laughs> is so that I'm not repeating the questions that I heard on uh, the other podcast that I enjoyed. I am going to ask you some different questions. So, okay, are we ready? Yeah. Okay, yeah. you guys can answer this together. You can give us your your own answers um, individually. So the first question is, if you could spend time with anyone, real or fictitious, dead or alive, who would you choose? Real or fictitious, dead or alive. I'll give you some examples to help you get your wheels turning. I think it would be fun to time travel with Marty McFly. So <laughs> fictitious, right? I think it would be, I don't know if it'd be fun to work out with Bruce Lee or smoke a blunt with Bob Marley, but dead, right? Um, yeah. Real, real or fictitious, dead or alive. Uh, I'd also love to like, I don't know, meet like a, a, a great, 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 grandfather just to see what my roots mm -hmm. you know where my roots look like uh so those are a couple of examples so real or fictitious dead or alive it has to be a person could it be an animal or anything <laughs> it could like be that? An, yeah it could be an animal are okay. you thinking of a pet? i think for me just right off the, the top of my head i'd love to go back to like the jurassic era oh. and just be a mosquito or something just flying around checking out these dinosaurs. I mean, it's still hard to process that those did exist on this planet at one point in time. I mean, it's it's bizarre to think that, but it is to go but... back and just be a yeah, a bird, something safe, you know. Um, and I don't know what my time limit is, so I might pick my my uh you transport animal differently but <laughs> if it's just for a half hour or an hour i think i could probably wing it as a bird um and get check out, out a lot of the jurassic era and just see these animals in real life um of all, i don't know that would just be so amazing of all the years i've been asking these questions that's probably the most unusual answer i've gotten <laughs> is to be a mosquito in the jurassic era so that's that's interesting. What about you, Kim? Have you have you thought of an answer for that? That. Um, yeah, I'm gonna go sentimental. The first thing that kind of popped into my head is um, my grandfather, who I love. It. Um, he passed um, maybe ten years ago. Maybe no, a lot longer. Yeah, maybe 15, 15, 15 years, years ago. ago. Mm -hmm. Um, and he was just um. I mean, maybe he was different with, you know, my dad. He see, I guess he was kind of a, a strict guy with my dad, but with two granddaughters, you know, he was always 
very sweet and um, always playing with us and uh, very affectionate with us. And um, he's someone that I still miss a lot. And, you know, as a kid, he, he died when I was mm, maybe in my 20s, early 20s. Oh, so wow. I, you know, I never, I, I did grow up with him, you know, in my life, but I never got to know him as, you know, an adult or like ask him about yeah. who he was as a teenager or, you know, ask him about, um, yeah, his life. You know, I didn't mm-hmm. really think of those things at that time. So I wish that I could have gotten more opportunity to really talk with him as, as an adult, maybe share a drink with him. Yeah, or something. That would have been fun. That'd be um, awesome. Yeah. yeah. I have the same kind of, uh, I don't know, is it, is it, guilt. I don't know if that's the right word, but you know, when I was in my twenties, I was too young, stupid and self-centered to care about those things. And it wasn't until they were gone that I thought, wow, you know, I should have asked them about their parents and their grandparents and what life was like when they were my age, you know, but I was too, you know, same thing, you know, that that's a great answer. Um, Okay. So let's move to the next question. I have a bunch of these. Uh, I wish I could ask them all, but I'm going to um, just limit it because our time is limited. The next question is, if you could travel anywhere in time, when would you go? So I'll share my answers with you guys. Um, So I would love to be at Don's Beach Comer Cafe when they opened on repeal day. I would love Mm. to be at the bar when Trader Vic invented the Mai Tai and I would like to be at the bar at the Tiki T when Ray Buen made his first race mistake when he made the mistake. Mm-hmm. So those are my mm-hmm. three answers for travel anywhere in time. When would you go? Mm. I feel like I've already <laughs> kind of answered the, that with the dress. Right. But moving on from that, um, yeah, man. Uh, I think I'd just go to the future. Yeah. I don't know. I, you know, Look the yourself past up. is all kind of written down in history books, and mm. I can maybe experience it through video or pictures. Or I kind of know what what to expect there, but the future is kind of unknown. So maybe I'd like to go and just check it out, see what's going on in the future. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I'm curious about that too. You know, I think I'd too. like to visit Waikiki before air travel when you were still going there by boat liner. And oh yeah, the, you know, one. in Hawaii, it has been marketed extremely differently after air travel. But you know, I'm sure you know. Prior to that, it was more about seeing the plantations mm-hmm. and the, the lush green mountains, and and now it's all about beach culture. But just to go there and you know, stay a night at the Moana. Or the, the yeah. what is it, the Royal Hawaiian. The Royal Hawaiian. And, you know, you spent two weeks to get there and just the, the nice, cool or warm summer breeze and just sitting there in the rocking chair or something, having a drink. It probably wouldn't be a Mai Tai. It wouldn't be. We know no, it that. wouldn't be. Um, but still, just, yeah, just really just being there. And it's like history. That would be really cool. That would be really cool. Seeing Waikiki yeah. before it was a forest of skyscrapers, right? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that would be awesome. That's a great answer. Okay, next question. Uh, if you could have – okay, let's see. Okay, I'm going to ask I'm going to ask you a few questions, and you guys can pick from this. Uh, I have, one question is, what's your guilty pleasure? What's your biggest pet peeve? If you could have, if you're stuck on a desert, uh, deserted island and you can only have three things, um, and what's on your bucket list? Let's pick, let's pick a couple of those. So, Kim, I'm going to let you pick uh, the, the next question we ask. Which one would you like out of those? What's your guilty pleasure? Um, what's your biggest pet peeve? If, you, if you're stuck on a deserted <laughs> island, three be things. Be authentic. Okay. Uh, yeah, we'll go with guilty pleasure. Okay. Guilty pleasure. What's your guilty pleasure? Um, love is blind. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Are you familiar with the Netflix reality show? Oh, gotcha. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, I like watching dramatic <laughs> TV shows like, um, yeah, love is blind. Uh, 
is my current favorite. Um, I get kind of engulfed in it and wrapped up in these people's relationships and all the drama, but it kind of lets me escape from just the everyday life and right. think about someone else's problems for a while. I love it. Okay, so your guilty pleasure, Brandon? Uh, probably the drink. The drink. Um, <laughs> I love a nice sugary drink. I have a sweet tooth. So I love you know, Navy Grog and Zombie 2. Yeah, but Yeah, it's not guilty, but you know, sometimes I can be a little too indulgent. So Same with me. Um, Same with me. I'm addicted to sugar, and I'm not afraid to admit yeah. it, right? <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> okay, mm-hmm. so we'll let Brandon pick the next question. What's your biggest pet peeve? Three things... Uh, uh, if you're stuck on a deserted island, three things, what, what would you choose? And what's on your bucket list? So out of those three questions, okay. which, would, which would you like to answer? Uh, let's do three things. I feel like I'd offend somebody with my pet peeve answer. Okay. So I'll steer away from that one. Okay, um, stuck on a deserted island, three things. But three things on a desert island. You could pick three, any three things. What would you choose? Um, rum, water, and lime. Oh, look out! Cocktails. <laughs> no, um, probably water though. I don't know how potable the water would be, so that's, that's a great question. If I want to live longer than a few days, then definitely water would be one. Um, hmm. Yeah, I don't know. Probably those things. If I'm stuck on an island by myself. Yeah, I'm probably going to go for it, you know, and just, <laughs> just start drinking. <laughs> <laughs> Might as well enjoy yourself, right? Yeah. yeah. How about you, Sorry. Karen? Three things on a deserted island. What would you choose? Um, well, I want to take this opportunity to defend an answer I gave on the other. Um, oh, do you want to answer biggest pet peeve? Is that what you uh, want to answer? No, no, no. About um, the deserted island. So. Okay. You know, we were asked what cocktail you would drink if you had like an endless supply of this cocktail on your deserted island okay. for the rest of your life. And Brandon rolled his eyes at my answer. <laughs> um, because so I said a uh, mint julep. And yeah, I'm rolling, obviously, I'm rolling you know, my eyes too. Not a drink that I <laughs> have every day or maybe even, okay. you know, I have it once every few months. Um, but I guess I was just going very logical and thinking, am I really going to drink a Navy grog for the rest of my life or like a jet pilot, you know, or something very strong or very spicy. And the mint julep is just refreshing and strong at the same time. You can drink it all day long. It's filled with crushed ice. So you get that water content. Um, so yeah, that was my answer for the Okay. So I'll Um, say along that line. So I, so I'm also rolling my eyes at your mint julep answer. (laughs) However, (laughs) however, (laughs) if you changed it to a mojito, uh, Uh, I'd be okay with that because that's refreshing. As long as it's, as long as it's real mint and it's not like mint syrup. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't taste like spearmint gum and it tastes like a real, like, Mm -hmm. you know, like a minted daiquiri ish kind of flavor. You know, I'd be okay mm-hmm. with that. Mm-hmm. So, so let's answer one. Yeah, let's I'm, answer uh, our last question right. all together. So, uh, what's on your bucket list for both of you? You might have already checked one of those off by opening the cousin room. Oh yeah, yeah. for sure. Um, I mean, just staying in line with maybe what we're doing at the bar and kind of our bucket list for the bar is getting a house mug um we're working with some artists right now and we're really hoping to get a house mug done maybe by our one year anniversary or sooner and yeah it's just i don't know you can't be a tiki bar without a mug right and so it's definitely on our bucket list for the bar now that we're running and operational i'm really excited about it it's going to be a little more unique too just like our bar and our concept um so we're really looking forward to it. We hope uh, people really like it. I think we've got some great artists that we're working with to put this together. Love so. that. Love that. Mm-hmm. Okay. What's on your bucket list, Kim? Um, in terms of life, um, I guess just getting back out and traveling. You know, since since we had our son, 
um, and said, well, since the pandemic hit, we weren't able to travel. And then after having our son, it's every trip has just been back to the U.S. Yeah. Right. Um, and I think there's, there's quite a few more places that we would like to get to um, on our bucket list. We want to go to South Africa. We've got some friends down there. Oh, that sounds that great. That want to visit. Um, the Maldives. Yeah, that yeah. sounds great too. I mean, it's easy to want to start <laughs> circling places and want to go. But yeah. Yeah, that sounds great though. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like, um, I think especially now with a kid, just having a nice tropical vacation where you yeah. can relax and not really have too much of an agenda. Yeah, stay at nice. like a resort where you can do a little bit of everything within mm -hmm. a short amount of distance. Um, because you know what it's like having kids and you're traveling and with yeah. the baby car and all yeah. that. It's just if we can just post up somewhere and have walkable access to a lot of entertainment without you know having to pack up and travel. That's what we try and do now. So yeah, yeah, uh, that's awesome. Yeah. Well, when they get when when your kids have you have one two. Yeah, just one. just one. One at the moment. Um, so when when your two year old becomes an adult like my kids, when we travel, I just tell them this is where I'm going. Like I'll tell them what you know, my wife and I. This is where <laughs> when, when when and where we're going. You're welcome to join us. You just have to buy your own ticket. So sometimes <laughs> they join, sometimes they don't. <laughs> so yeah. so much easier. <laughs> I like that. Though. Good. Yeah. So. Uh, before we wrap, I just want to ask you one quick question about the the, the cousin room. Uh, what's the future? Uh, have, what do you envision for the next couple of years with the bar? Uh, do you envision opening another location or opening stateside or anything like that? Or what do you what do you see in the next couple of years? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, yeah, you know, it's hard to answer because we are you know, new, we've only been open for almost five months now. And it's hard to kind of see past the, uh, the kind of the cloud of just opening and running the bar and right. still marketing, right. bringing in right. regular, but let's say all that's up and running and, you know, mugs are selling and the glassware is selling and we've got tiki tourists and everyone coming through. Um, I don't know. I think we just love to parlay our experience, our expertise, our knowledge into American tiki culture as we transition back into living in America, maybe trying our hand at running or operating a tiki bar restaurant experience. I really would love to open a motel, like a roadside motel, um, do like a tiki theme. Maybe if we could already find one with some good bones and some vintage flair, yeah. just kind of redecorating it and having like the tiki roadside motel and doing a bar and motel there. I think that would be really cool. Um, and that would be a bucket list of mine too. So yeah, I don't know. Just kind of keep being entrepreneurial and kind of rolling in the tiki culture. We love it. So it comes natural to us and yeah. I love it. I love it. Well, we, before we wrap, let's tell our listeners how they can find you guys online um, social media handles, website, anything like that, as well as throw out if, if there's a way that an easy way for them to come see you. Like if you have, uh, if you have any tips for our listeners. Okay. Well, yeah. So our Instagram handle is at the cause on room, uh, cause on K A Z A N. And, uh, yeah, we do most of our, our promotion through, Instagram. Yeah. Okay. Um, finding our location. So you can find us on Google Maps. Sure. Apple um, Maps, too, if you use Apple Maps. I don't know who does, but <laughs> somebody does. So. Right. Um, so Google Maps, and um, we are at a building that's got two elephants out front. So it's very easy to find, very mm. recognizable. Um, however, so you have to go up to the fourth floor, and then... Uh, a lot of people have complained we're hard to find, which is kind of intentional. Yeah, you know, slightly speakeasy yeah. style. Okay. We've got um, we've got a purple light out front that should be illuminated when we're open, and then we have like a tiny little pin um, on our door of our our logo. Yeah. So um, wow. it's just a white door at the end of the hallway. If you're on the fourth floor, you're in the right place. Yeah. So just. Keep looking. And okay. I think thinking bigger, you know, if you're in the Osaka 
city or even Kyoto and you're traveling and you're riding Shinkansen, mm. it's only a 20 minute train ride to oh, downtown awesome. Kobe. And then okay. I think it's about a 10 minute walk from the station. So you can be here, you know, in a matter of a half hour or so. Um, yeah, a lot so, of our out of town guests uh, are visiting Osaka mm-hmm. and, and visit us from there. Yeah, so if you're okay. not like intentionally saying, oh, I'm gonna go to Kobe, you probably will find yourself in Osaka or Kyoto. And at that point, it should be easy enough to get here. And we're open pretty late, too. So uh, for anyone who's thinking about traveling out here in the near future or whenever, you know, you don't have to stay in Kobe to come and experience our mm-hmm. bar. Like, it's it, totally accessible and doable. So, But a lot of people also find, uh, you know, Kobe Kobe's not really on most people's radar as far as a, a city to visit in mm-hmm. Japan. Um, it is really close to Osaka and Kyoto, which are great tourist areas. Um, but people who do come here are really impressed that it's a little bit more down to earth. It's much less touristy. Mm-hmm. You're going to meet locals and they're probably going to try and speak to you in Japanese. Um, they might take you for a local more than, than as a tourist. And um, yeah, the feel, the vibe is just a little different here. Yeah. The slower pace. Okay. and. Um, exactly. A lot of people enjoy that. Yeah. Too, so. so again, it's a, just a great place to travel, have a nice drink, and kind of get out of the city for a little bit and get out of the touristy traps of the larger Japanese cities. If you want a nice relaxing night with a couple of tiki cocktails, I definitely say make your way down to Kobe and check us out for mm-hmm. sure. That sounds heavenly to me. So one of these days I'm going to find my way to your bar, I promise. Um, we want to thank you guys for taking the time out of your busy schedule to sit down with me on the podcast and telling us all about your story and for our listeners out there um, check them out they're they're right there on Instagram we'll put all the links down in the description below and uh, and uh, thanks again for joining us for another episode of Inside the Desert Oasis Room if you'd like to help support the show we have a Patreon which is at patreon.com slash Polynesian Pop And you can find our archive at DesertOasisRoom.com, including this episode, which you can also find wherever you listen to podcasts. So we'll have this up on Spotify, iHeartRadio, Apple Apple Music. That's what they're calling it these days, right? It used to be iTunes. (laughs) Um, Google Play, Podcast Addict, Podomatic, all that stuff. So Brandon, Kim, thanks again for for, uh, joining us. How do I say goodbye in Japanese? Sayonara. 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 Bye.